Hi, this is Ashley Victoria Robinson coming to you live from the Popverse, a virtual realm created by Read Pop. And we are here today to talk about a staplehood of your childhood and mine, a Goosebumps. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> One of the best parts about being here in the Popverse is we have access to so many amazing panels, including one with the talent behind the preeminent creators of the world of children's horror. Now, in partnership with Goosebumps the Musical, the Phantom of the Auditorium, we are sharing the world premiere of the Goosebumps anniversary panel with R. L. Stein himself from the recent New York Comic Con. This is one of our most popular panels at our most popular show, highlighting the best selling books of R. L. Stein published by Scholastic that have been nothing less than the star of book fairs for generation after generation. Goosebumps the musical Phantom of the Auditorium is musical theater's best kept secret. A thrilling new musical based on R.L. Stein's iconic series with a billboard charting album featuring an all-star cast of Broadway talent, including Christina Alabato, Alex Brightman from Beetlejuice, Noah Galvin, Cheryl Lee Ralph, the dream girl from Abbott Elementary, Will Rowland, Stephanie Stiles, and a special cameo appearance from R.L. Stein himself. Don't forget to check out the Goosebumps the Musical album on Spotify and peep that incredible album art by Tim Jacobus, who you're going to see on the panel that we're going to show you momentarily. Thanks, Goosebumps the Musical Phantom of the Auditorium for joining us to present the full Goosebumps anniversary celebration panel with R.L. Stein himself, from NYCC. To get things started, we're gonna bring up Josh Weiss, who is the writer for Sci-Fi Wire. Oh, it's Bob's birthday? It's Bob's birthday, folks. Okay, on the count of three, we're just gonna scream happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday. Congratulations, Bob. And now we're gonna bring up Josh Weiss, writer of Sci-Fi Wire, author of Beat the Devils. Let's give it up for your moderator, Josh Weiss. New York Comic Con, beware, you're in for a scare. And let's welcome up the legend himself, Mr. R.L. Stein. Are they really here to see me? What? I think what so. Is this? I really don't believe this. This is uh, well, overwhelming. I, I mean, it's. I heard there was standing room because every seat was filled. So it's like the stones that have come to That's town. Good. You know, what? Well, I was gonna why ask, don't Why don't they all buy the books? <laughs> where, where were you when the books come out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd just like to remind no, you No, I know. Them. Look, it's a real adult audience, too. I know what I am to you. I'm nostalgia. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about being nostalgia. Where, where are the kids? These are the kids. Where are they? It's been 30 yeah. years. <laughs> this is so nice. This is too nice for me. Well, I, it's much too nice. It's amazing. And I'd just like to remind you all that Mr. Stein here has been scaring us all for 30 years and that Goosebumps is one of the best-selling children's series in history with over 400 million copies sold worldwide. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. But I don't, I don't know who counted them. I don't know about who counted 400 million books. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Well, happy birthday again. <laughs> Thanks. Are you doing anything special to celebrate? Yeah, I'm here. Look at this. <laughs> what, could be a, what could be a better birthday than this? My God. Incredible. Well, very nice. And Are we done? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. Yeah. Um, no, let's, let's go back to the start of Goosebumps. It's been 30 years since Welcome to Dead House, the summer of 1992. Um, and when we spoke earlier this summer, uh, you said that the idea for Goosebumps originated with one of your editors, correct? I, yeah, I never had an idea in my life. <laughs> it all came from someone else. But no, I, here, the actual truth is, I was doing Fear Street books. 
Um, yeah, give it up series. for Fear Thank Street. We were, I was killing off teenagers every month, killed a lot of teenagers, and was doing really well. And my editors, a couple editors said, you know, we should try a scary series for 7 to 11-year-olds. And I said, no way, because I didn't want to mess up Fear Street. And no one had ever done it before, but that's the kind of businessman I am. I didn't want to do goosebumps. You believe that? And then finally, they kept after me, and I said, all right, if I can think of a good name for the series, um, we can try two or three. And so I went home, I was trying to think of a good name for Goosebumps, you know, for the, for the book series. And I was, this is true, I was reading TV Guide magazine. And in those days, they used to have the TV listings in the middle of the book, and everything that was on TV. And I was going through the magazine, and there was a little ad at the bottom of the page, and it said, it's Goosebumps Week on Channel 11. And I just stared at it. I just stared at that ad. I said, that's perfect. We'll call it Channel 11. <laughs> no, don't laugh at that. No, that's a horrible joke. <laughs> but that's, that's really where the name Goosebumps came from. And I said, okay, we'll try two or three. And now it's 30 years later. Right. That's amazing. And you were doing, you were writing for the magazine Bananas, the comedy magazine. Well, that was Goosebumps. my magazine. That was your magazine. I, you know, I never, it's honestly true, I never planned to be scary. It never occurred to me to be scary. I always just wanted to be funny. I was jovial Bob Stein for years. And I did this humor magazine called Bananas for 10 years. That was like my life's dream, to have my own humor magazine. And when that ended, I thought I would just coast the rest of my life. <laughs> I had no idea. But it's a very embarrassing story um, that it wasn't my idea to be scary. I, I'd always loved horror. I grew up with a, EC horror comics, The Vault of Horror, and Tales from the Crypt. I loved those when I was a kid, but I never planned to write it. And then one day, I was having lunch with this woman, Jean Fywell, who was the editorial director at Scholastic. And we were having lunch, and she arrived at lunch angry. She had just had a fight with a guy who wrote YA horror, who shall remain nameless, Christopher Pike. And, Shots fired. and she said, I'm never working with him again. You could write a good teen horror novel. Go home and write a book called Blind Date. She even gave me the title. And I didn't know what she was talking about. What's teen horror? I didn't know. I ran out. This is embarrassing because it wasn't my idea. And I ran out to the bookstore and I got books by Christopher Pike and Lois Duncan and Diane Ho and uh, Richie Tankersley Cusick. Remember her? Are these book, who were writing teen horror already and bought their books and then tried to figure out what I could do with, uh, with my books. And then Blind Date, I wrote it, and it came out as a number one bestseller. And then I'd never been close to that, you know, with my funny stuff. And a year later, I wrote another teen horror book called Twisted, and it was a number one bestseller. And I said, forget the funny stuff, <laughs> right? I mean, I've been scary ever since. That's all right. You don't have to clap. <laughs> and just going back to the start of it with Dead House, tell me, why, why was that the genesis? Why did you want to riff on the haunted house concept in the first book? Well, it was a zombie book, Welcome to Dead House. And you know, I've always thought that book is too scary for the series. I didn't really know what I was doing yet. And I didn't have the combination of humor and scares. I didn't have it. I just didn't know. And I just think it's a book about a boy who moves to a new town, and everyone comes up to him, everyone he meets, and says, I used to live in your house. I used to live in your house. And it's, it's basically a whole town of zombies he's moved to. But I always thought that book was too scary for Goosebumps. Then I could sort, the second book was Stay Out of the Basement. <clears throat> and that's funny, right? I, that had, a, you know, a lot of... I, I think I caught on by the second book. Right, and can you talk about that, uh, the TV adaptation of 
stay out of the basement. That twist ending. It's always stuck with me. <laughs> you know, with the flowers saying, that I'm your started, father. It's about a, a father who's turning into a plant. And uh, it just started, people always say, where'd you get the idea for that? Where'd you get the idea? And usually I don't remember. But <laughs> no, really, you don't remember. Where, where'd you get your ideas, right? Yeah. But um, I had this just picture in my head of a father, a man, who takes off his baseball cap, and instead of hair, he has leaves growing out of his head. And I just had that picture, and the whole book actually grew out of that picture. That's awesome. And looking at the Goosebumps writing process on a general scope, I mean, what, what would you say is your, how do you approach a book? What's your writing process like? My writing process? Well, I work backwards for most authors, I think. I think most authors get an idea for a book and they start writing and then later they think of a title. But I, I have to have the title first. And I, I tell you the truth, you know, I've written every story a human can write, right? I mean, there's nothing else to write. So I don't really think about ideas. I don't try to get ideas now, I just try to think of titles. And I think of the title and the title will lead me to the story. And that's, that's how I start every book. I was walking my dog in um, Riverside Park, and these words flashed into my head. Say cheese and die. <laughs> where? I don't know. Where did that come from, right? I just have this. So I said, what? That's a great title. Where? Yeah, what, what could it be? Um, maybe these kids find an old camera, and maybe the camera takes photos of bad things that happen in the future. And that's how, that's how I do almost every book. I had, I had this great title I loved um, called Little Shop of Hamsters. <laughs> and I thought, oh, great, I have to write that. But then, how do you make a hamster scary? <laughs> that, was, that one was a challenge. I'll tell you a title I've always wanted to do and can't do, okay? Here's a, I just think a really good Goosebumps title. Morons from Mars. <laughs> it's a good title, right? And um, my editor, I took it to my editor, Scholastic. I said, I'd like to do a book called Morons from Mars. He said, you can't do that. You'll offend the morons. <laughs> That's true. He really said that. I'll offend the morons. So I couldn't do that title. It's not too late. <laughs> Everyone's offended these days. <laughs> Uh, and how long would you say it takes you to write a Goosebumps book? How long? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I used to be faster. I, you know, I outline every book first. I do a complete chapter-by-chapter chapter outline of every book. And when I start to write, when I sit down, I know everything that's going to happen in the book. I've done the whole hard part. I've done all the thinking so that I can just enjoy the writing. So I usually spend a week on the outline, right? And maybe two weeks now, two weeks to write the book two to three weeks. Right. And what's the process for coming up with twists? Because twi Goosebumps books aren't no, Goosebumps without no, twists, right? Yeah, you know, there's no process. Everyone always says, oh, yeah, he found the formula. He found the formula. <laughs> there's no, what's the formula? I wish I knew the formula. I don't know the formula. Right, and there's that great line in the Goosebumps film. Oh, yeah, tell, you know, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, yeah, no, I, seriously, I, I wish I had written this. It's a perfect line. It's in um, the first Goosebumps movie. Jack Black is me. And at the end of the movie, he's teaching school. And he says this line I wish I'd written. He says to the students, he says, every book has a beginning, a middle, and a twist. That's like perfect, right? I wish I'd written that. <laughs> and, uh, well, we're going to have Tim Jacobus come up here soon. He's the uh, original illustrator of a vast majority of all those amazing Goosebumps covers. He's going to join, jo come up on stage and talk with uh, Mr. Stein soon. But I just wanted to bring up Tim quickly because I think his painting nice. should be in the Louvre because they're yeah, just I so like awesome. Yeah, I like to do this because Tim does all the work. He shows <laughs> and I just watch and make comments. He's got all his art, the original art and everything. And Tim, you did like over 100 Goosebumps covers. It was pretty amazing. <laughs> and I'll tell you, we, we had a very strange way of working. I was writing a Goosebumps book every month. I was doing 12 a year. 
and we had to write, and I would be writing the book, but he had to paint the cover before the book, we even knew what it was. And he, it was, I would send him like a little paragraph of what the book was going to be. And he had to paint his cover from that. And he got almost every single cover matched the book. It was perfect, except for one book. There was one time where he totally missed. And it was, it was Say Cheese and Die. It was that book, it, which was about an evil camera and kids who find an evil camera. And uh, the painting came in from Tim. It was a family of skeletons barbecuing. There's no, <laughs> I don't know, there it was. And of course, he couldn't change the painting, right? And the editor calls me and says, Bob, you have to add a scene with skeletons barbecuing. <laughs> so the cover would make sense. And I did, I added a dream sequence with the kids dreaming about skeletons barbecuing. So that, and that was the only time, the only time that uh, didn't work out. And I think you said your favorite cover was for The Barking Ghost, right? The Barking Ghost cover is a great, ferocious, it's a horrible book. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really one of the worst Goosebumps books. But, but the, it has a great, vicious dog cover. There, you know, they can't all be great. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and since I'm wearing the shirt, Hi, you know, repping yeah, the merch, nice, nice. let's talk about The Haunted Mask. Well, the haunted mask. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I that's my favorite. I think my best Halloween book. Uh, you know, it's about this girl, Carly Beth, who wants to be scary at Halloween time, and she pulls this really ugly mask down over her head, and it sticks to her face, and she can't get it off, and it starts to turn her evil. And I, you know, I like that book because it's one of the few books that was inspired by something that really happened. When my son Matt was real little, he was a little guy, and it was Halloween time, and I was watching him. He was in the, down on the floor in the living room, and I was watching him, and he tried on this green rubber Frankenstein mask, and he pulled it down over his head, and he couldn't get it off. And I'm watching from the doorway, and he's tugging and tugging, and I thought, what a great idea for, I should have helped him. <laughs> I didn't win the Good Parent Award that day. But uh, I thought, great idea, I just started making notes. Great idea for a story. Yeah. And that became The Haunted Mask. Yeah, and I think and, I speak for most of us here when I say the, that episode of television uh, is why most of us have emotional scarring to this day. <laughs> it was a very, very creepy episode. Yeah, that was the very first uh, TV show we did. It was the very first in the series. We did it in a suburb outside Toronto. And it was spring. It wasn't fall. It wasn't Halloween time. And the TV people brought in huge bags of brown leaves and scattered them all over the lawns so it would look like... Here's, here's a behind-the-scenes story from The Haunted Mask, okay? We had this wonderful uh, young actress named... Uh, Kathleen, Catherine Long. Is that her name? Catherine Long. And she played Carly Beth. She was terrific. And maybe you remember, if you've seen the show, very early in the show, these two boys are teasing Carly Beth, and they give her a sandwich with a worm in it. And they're in the lunchroom. And she bites, she eats the say she doesn't know. So we got all ready to film this scene, and we got a sandwich, and we put a plastic worm in it and took it down to the set. And we were going to film, and she came to us, and she said, you know, I don't think I can do this scene with a plastic worm. I think I need a real worm. Oh. Right. So we said, okay, fine. And uh, we went out and got a real worm and put it in the sandwich took it to the lunchroom, the two boys give it to her, and we start to film, and she bit into it, and you wanna hear the really sad part? The really sad part of the story? We had to shoot the scene 12 times. Oh. 12 worms. Oh my. 
was Go Eat Worms, would that, had that been published already? Because that... Is... You keep bringing up my really bad books. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, that Go Eat of... Worms may be the worst of them all. But you have that great cover of the worms coming out of the well, sandwich. Yeah, I know. The, well, it should have been a good or, book. Yeah. I mean, worms, come on. Worms are kind of creepy. It just, you know, I, God, I read it fairly recently. It's awful. Oh, I'm sorry. But great title, right? <laughs> Um, and I want to ask about another one of your uh, cre- oh, two more of your creations, actually. The first one is Monster Blood. I think that's like a great kind of subversion of we all love slime as kids. We all have to play with green slime. And that's kind of like, what if it was sentient and would eat you, essentially? So what, what was the impetus behind that? Grow and grow. I don't know. I don't know what the impetus was. <laughs> I honestly, I, I think the words popped into my head and it just grew from there, I think. And, you know, I worked for Nickelodeon for a while. I did a show, a preschool show for kids called Eureka's Castle for four years. Oh, hey, really? You remember it? Yeah, yeah, I, that, was a, I mean, that was my whole TV career. I did all the puppet episodes for Eureka, but everybody watched Barney the Dinosaur instead. I know, that horrible dinosaur puppet. But I'm, and so I worked for Nickelodeon, so I, of course I had sl- slime on my mind. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's where it came from. Right. And uh, this is the last monster I want to look at is King Jelly Jam. It's just like this horrific, <laughs> it makes Jabba the Hutt look, you know, like a gentleman. <laughs> so. Yeah, I can't. King Jelly Jam, that book was about a summer camp, and it's run by this monster Jelly Jam. This was my smelliest book. Jelly Jam is a horrible smell. You smell terrible. He smelled so bad, the campers had to bathe him 24 hours a day. And the way the book ends, I'm going to spoil it for you, um, <clears throat> they decide to stop bathing him, and he dies from his own odor. Right. And that's it. And now people on Twitter, people ask, say, are you going to do a sequel to that? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What could a sequel be? How could there be a sequel to that? I don't know, but people keep asking for it. It's funny you mentioned that one. I'd love to see an R-rated adaptation, like set in the 80s or something. I think that could be cool. Right? <laughs> all right. Yeah, see, they don't Never agree. mind then. Okay. They don't agree with you at all. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just show myself out. Good. Um, we got to bring Tim up here. Come on. <laughs> Very soon. I promise. You won't have to put up with me for much longer. <laughs> Come on, Josh. Um, so it's been 30 years. Uh, at what point did you know, okay, this is, this is crazy. This is a phenomenon. Here's when I knew my life was changing, okay? I'm from uh, Columbus, Ohio, and I was in Columbus to do a book signing, a Goosebumps book signing, at a Borders store in Columbus. I think it was Borders. And I'm trying to get to the book signing, and I'm in a horrible traffic jam. And I'm really, it makes me nervous. I hate to be late. I don't want to be late for a signing. And I'm stuck in traffic. And I look in all the cars, and they're all filled with kids. They were all coming to see me. It was my traffic jam. <laughs> and yeah, that's when I knew things were going to get a little weird. That's awesome. And you've been all over the world with Goosebumps. I mean, how many languages has it been translated into now? Oh, I don't know. How many languages are there? <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. A lot. A lot. So, but you've been all over the globe with this, with this series. I've been really lucky. I had, I had a, a wonderful book tour in China and a wonderful tour in Australia. Yeah, that's, how lucky is that? It's, I mean, it's awesome. And so what has been your most memorable experience getting to travel with this book, these books? Oh, I have too many memories, too many really wonderful memories to do it. You know, we had a, we had a Goosebumps Horrorland at Disney World. That was a real, I'm a big Disney fan, so that was a real thrill for me to have my own land, right? (laughs) That was pretty amazing. I have, you know, my favorite thing is the mail from kids. That's my favorite thing of being R.L. Stein, really, of of everything. Uh, The mail I get is so amazing. Last week, I got a letter from a girl that said, Dear R.L. Stein, you're my second favorite author. That was the whole letter. That was it. Talk about keeping you in suspense, right? Said, Dear R.L. Stein, I don't know if you remember me or not, but when you came to my school, I'm the one who stepped on your foot. That was good. I remember that kid. 
And maybe, maybe you've heard me tell, you probably have, tell my all-time favorite letter from a kid, from all the years, from a boy. Dear R.L. Stein, I've read 40 of your books, and I think they're really boring. <laughs> <laughs> like the perfect letter, right? At least he was honest. <laughs> um, and something we haven't talked about, uh, any Choose Your Own Adventure Goosebumps fans in the audience? <clears throat> yeah. Everybody loved those books. We did about 100 uh, Give Yourself Goosebumps books. I'd love, nobody wants them now. What's publishers that about? don't, you know, there's, things go in trends and crazes. And publishers, I don't know why Scholastic hasn't thought of doing this, because I get on Twitter and Facebook, people are always asking me for the multiple ending books. But nobody really wants to do them anymore. Right. It's a serious answer. Right, and can you talk about, um, when, we, when we spoke earlier in the year, you talked about your, uh, you said they're pretty, you know, they're easier than they look to write, right? Is that correct? Yeah, you, they are. They look like they're hard to write, but you just, you know, number from one to a hundred, and you figure out a punchline, and you do a little story, and you fill in your chart. This would go to page 10, would go to page 20, and it's like, it's, it's like writing jokes, really, and it's, it's not that hard. Right. And but nobody wants them. <laughs> <laughs> do we want some, folks? Do we want more? Yeah, I know. <clears throat> there you go. I actually, I went three years without writing a book that had an ending. <laughs> they were all multiple choice right. books. And we haven't talked about the unofficial, official mascot of the franchise, Slappy. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think Except, he's so beloved? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Slappy's my favorite character and my least favorite character. And... Um, He's my favorite character because everyone likes him so much, especially after the Goosebumps movies. He was really big. And I like him because at Halloween time, thousands of kids now go out as Slappy. And that's really exciting to me. And I, I did a talk in a big theater in Toronto a couple years ago, and 40 people came dressed as Slappy to the audience. I brought them all on stage. <laughs> it looked great. Right? And... Um, He's my least favorite character because I'm sick of writing about him. <laughs> no, I've written 15 books about a dummy that comes to life. That's a lot, right? So I think we're actually going to think we're going to start doing some new stuff. Right, and we just got the official backstory for him, right? In Slappy Beware that came out a few weeks ago. Slappy Beware has the official. I think I've written how many backstories for Slappy? How Several. many origins have I done? In one book, he escaped from a puppet factory in Cincinnati. But that couldn't be true, right? So though this has the real backstory, the real origin of Slappy. And then it's got a pretty good story. It's about the worst day in Slappy's life where nothing works and everything, and it looks like Slappy is doomed. Just wishful thinking. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, that's, uh, now see, that's a pre this is a pretty good book. It's the first hardcover illustrated Goosebumps book. So that's nice. Nice way to celebrate the anniversary. That's amazing. Have, has everyone picked up a copy yet? <clears throat> I'd like to remind you there will be a signing in, in Hall A from 215 to 345 with Mr. Stein and Mr. Jacobus. So uh, don't miss out on that. Um, That'll be fun. Uh, I want to talk about the TV series again, the, the original one. Uh, you appeared in, a, in several episodes, almost like as a Rod Serling type figure. What was, what was that like? Yeah, I did introductions to all the prime time shows. And I was, um, I'd never done that before on television. I was extremely overconfident. Because <laughs> I would memorize the script on the plane up to Toronto. And then I'd get in front of the camera and they'd say, well, do you want a teleprompter? I said, I don't need a teleprompter. I memorized it, right? And then I'd get in front of the camera and he said, well, let's do a run-through. Fine. Hi, I'm R.L. Stein. I... Gone. <laughs> Everything gone. <laughs> yes. Do you have a teleprompter? Uh, you know, I don't know. Like... Can we get one? <laughs> yeah, maybe in the back room. <laughs> yeah. Um, and... No, that was fun, though. <clears throat> uh, 
I was, it was the first time I was on television. It was on Fox, primetime Fox, the very first show. And um, it was my mother lived out in California. And I mean, what an exciting thing to be on primetime television for, with your own series for the first time. And I remember I waited, and I, California time, and I called her, Mom, did you see the show? She said, wouldn't you know it, I fell asleep. Do you have a tape? Do you have a tape? <laughs> a little true life there. Yeah, things used a to be recorded. true life horror there. <laughs> and looking at the film, um, you had Jack Black playing you almost hey, in this. Jack and I are like twins, right? <laughs> no, people get us mixed up all the time. You know, I told this story yesterday. We were trying to figure out who should play me in the Goosebumps movie. And they were talking to Jack Black. We, no one had, I asked my son, I said, Matt, who do you think should play me? And he said, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> so, <laughs> not too helpful, but you know, it's fine. And then they were talking to Jack Black and, uh, and I put it on Twitter. I said, Jack Black to play me in the movie. And a bunch of people you know, wrote back and they said, oh, he's fabulous, he's hilarious, your movie will be great. And then some people said, he sucks, your movie's doomed already. <laughs> and then a lot of people said, well, you should play yourself in the Goosebumps movie. Who knows you better than you? And I went to my wife, Jane, and I said, you know, Jay, I have to warn you, this is a devastating line. I said, Jane, a lot of people think I should play myself in the Goosebumps movie. And she said, you're too old to play yourself. <laughs> and of Ouch. course it's true. <laughs> true. How horrifying is that? Well, you did appear at the end there, well, in the I, first movie. I had my little five seconds. Yeah. And other than Jack Black and Morgan Freeman, who else was considered for the I role? I don't know. I don't know. I think Jack was very early on. Mm -hmm. Jack flew in in a, in a blizzard to meet me. <laughs> and we had lunch, and he just stared at me the whole time, and he said, Bob, what in the script is true about you? And I said, Jack, not a single thing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, there's nothing true. He said, all right, I'm going to play a sinister version of you. And that's what he did. Dig it. And we have a new Disney Plus series coming up based on Goosebumps, and we just got some casting news this week. Justin Long. Just join the cast. I know, it's exciting. A whole new series. Yeah, anything you can tease about that? I don't, I can't tell you anything. <laughs> Maybe I don't know anything, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in production this month, I was starting to film this month. Right, and um, this is your second, or your, your second Disney Plus series to be based on Well, your I have a series based on my graphic novels, Just Beyond, right. which is eight episodes on uh, Disney Plus, and they're really nice. They're sort of Twilight Zone for kids. I'm very, I love those, those shows. Right, and just looking, I mean, now it's 30 years, we have all your goosebumps, not just as books, in all these different mediums. I mean, why do you think this IP is so enduring all these years later? You know, <clears throat> I think kids, seriously, I, like, I think people like goosebumps because it's not linear at all. So much of children's literature just goes in a straight line, and you know what's going to happen. And Goosebumps, I, to me, the most important thing are the twists and all the surprises. And I want somewhere in the book, the reader has to say, oh, no, I had no idea that was what was going on. I love, you know, fooling them. And I think that they like that, and I think the surprises are the main reason that Goosebumps has been around so long. Right. And something you said uh, when we spoke earlier over the summer again, I just I thought that was, uh, was a really cool insight, was that you know, kids like to be scared, but only if they know they're safe. Can you expound well, on yeah. that a little bit? No, okay. you, why do pe everyone likes scary stuff, yeah. right? We all like horror, but when we know we're safe at the same time, and for a kid to have these scary adventures and be fighting these evil things, and you, they know they're in their room reading at the same time, um, <clears throat> I think that's a big part of the appeal. And they all have to have happy endings. They demand happy endings. Uh, that's a really important part. I, uh, I once wrote a Fear Street book with an unhappy ending. It was, I think it was called The Best Friend. 
And in the end, the good girl is taken away as a murderer, and the murderer gets off scot-free. And I just did it for fun for me, just for once, have a little fun. And the kids hated, the kids turned on me immediately. And I started at my mail, dear R.L. Stein, you moron. You idiot, R.L. Stein, you idiot. How could you write that? Are you going to write a sequel to finish the story? And every, I would go visit schools, and some kid hold up their hand every time. Why did you write that book? Why did you do that? It haunted me. And I had, I had to write a sequel. They absolutely couldn't accept an unhappy ending. It's interesting, kind of. And now I have a big question for you. Are you aware of the Ermagerd goosebumps? Of meme? course, of course. What are your thoughts? Well, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. And then I got to like it. Then I got. It, it was, and then I got to like it. It's funny. Who brought it to your attention? It's funny. You know who brought it to my attention? Jeff Kinney. Oh, the uh, Diary Jeff, of a Jeff Wimpy Kinney Kid. Jeff Kinney writes right? the Wimpy Kid books. I was at a book convention with him, and Jeff Kinney came running over and said, "Bob, look at this. Look at this. What do you think?" He's, I don't know why he's so anxious to show it to me. <laughs> and uh, I hated it immediately. But um, I got, to, you know, it's funny. Right. And who would you say is the most unexpected Goosebumps fan you've met over the years? I, I well, I, most unexpected Goosebumps? I don't know. I have to tell you, yesterday, maybe she's here today. I did a book signing here yesterday, and a woman came up to the table she had flown 27 hours to be here from Kuwait. She came from Kuwait to meet me. And I just, I haven't really gotten over that. That's really, I know, that's unbelievable, right? That's amazing. No, I, what an amazing thing. I mean, look, we have a full room packed. <laughs> packed to the rafters. They're not from Kuwait. Yeah. <laughs> come on. <laughs> we don't know that for sure. I, I don't. I wouldn't come from Kuwait to see me. <laughs> but I live right up the street, so it's easy for me. Right. And now, I mean, we're back after post-COVID. It's great to be back in person, right? Sure is. Um, and I mean, just what's what's it like now? You know, after lot being locked down for the last few years, and now being back in person, getting to tour again and meet the fans. What well, was that a question or what? Yeah, what's, what? you know, what's your, what's that like? No, it's great to be back out. I love seeing my readers, and I love, you know, what's not to love? Come on, look at this room. It's amazing. So it is, it's great to be back. Awesome. Um, yeah, Bob, that really does it for my official list of questions. Anything to nice. add? No, I, thank you all. Thanks, everybody. You really... Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And that's not the end of the panel, folks. We have the man himself, Goosebumps illustrator extraordinaire, Tim Jacobus. Yay. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> this is great. I How's love it going? doing this. I love seeing all your old art. Oh, Tim, thank Tim you. was right from the beginning, the very first Goosebumps. And, but we didn't meet for three years. Yeah. It's, how weird is that? I, they, didn't, they kept us apart for some reason. Yeah, you'd think that didn't authors want us and illustrators meet. would be side by side, and you'd be calling me up and asking me stuff. And, no, I didn't nah, meet you for I mean, three years. It didn't matter. So, yeah, uh, everybody who's here today, it's nice to see you all. Uh, you've stopped down at my table, and the number one question you've all been asking me is, where's Bob Stein? He's right here. Finally, I know the answer. He's right here. So we got some slides that we're going to show you, and it's uh, artwork that Bob and I worked on together, and uh, uh, some of your favorites, I hope. So if can we could go to it. There? Why don't you turn yeah. your stool around? That's a good idea. Yeah, so you can see better. Can you see anything? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. We're good. All right, good. All right, so I started out my illustrious career, and um, my parents, you know, I, 
LeBron James' parents. <laughs> they knew right away that he was destined for greatness in basketball. Uh, my parents, um, the, that was not there. And they, they noticed I didn't know how to spell. Uh, I couldn't put any arms on George Washing. So um, I think they were just happy I got past the third grade. We were working on a series of books out of Scholastic. Uh, they were called Women in Jeopardy. And it was always kind of the same theme to the books, where there'd be a mom and she would stumble onto a, a murder mystery and she would uh, you know, solve it herself. And I did a, a series of buildings and it was always kind of a, a formula. And you would have what we call the worm's eye view in the illustration and you'd put something going on in that low foreground, and then the building would be large and foreboding, and it, it's, it's kind of dramatic, and it works well on a book cover. So when Welcome to Dead House came along, one of the authors, uh, one of the art directors said, hey, you know, we really like what you were doing with those women in Jeopardy things, so this Welcome to Dead House, can we do that worm's eye view thing? So I used, uh, I used an old trick for a, a new book series, and uh, that's how uh, Welcome to Dead House got off the ground. So the haunted mask. Behind the haunted mask is my goddaughter, Jessie. And Goosebumps was starting to get popular, and I said, Jessie, you want to be on a Goosebumps cover? And she's like, yeah, oh, man, Uncle Jake, I want to be on the Goosebumps cover. And then I brought her over to the house, and I always take pictures of uh, people when I use real humans in the stories. I like to take photographs. And I handed her a mask. It didn't look like that mask. Um, and then I told her to put it over her face. At that point, she realized no one was ever going to recognize her on that Goosebumps cover. She was so mad. You see that horrible face on that mask? That's nothing compared to what was going on behind that mask. She wouldn't talk to me for the longest time. Luckily, this became one of the biggest sellers in the series, and I got her a couple of cases of books. She passed them out to her friends, and she was able to tell her friends that at least the top of her head was on a Goosebumps cover. Oh, there it is. That's it. <laughs> I know we talked about this, he talk, Bob talked about this a little at the beginning, but this cover for me was when I kind of understood what Goosebumps was about, because, yeah, there was a horror element to it, but there was also a comic element to it. And so when I did this cover, I thought I hit a home run. I, I thought this was perfect. Funny, you know, we got the family of skeletons, and then I turned it in, and, you know, I said, what did Bob think? And he hated it. <laughs> Only because he didn't hate it. I'm making all that up. But it's, it is funny, and I, didn't, I actually didn't know this story till years later. Um, I was surprised that I wasn't asked to, to redo my work, and you were asked to redo your work. No, they, no, they never ask the artist. <laughs> never. It's always the writer. Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes. This is the, uh, uh, when you do illustrations for books, you usually have to change lots of stuff because you're doing art by committee. And for some reason with the goosebump stuff, I think it's due to the fact that Bob was such a fast writer and we were putting out the book so quickly. We didn't have a lot of time to be messing with stuff. So when I finished this cover, this was the only one they asked me to change. So we have the, the two gnomes there, and the guy in the back is scratching the side of his head. In the original, he had his finger jammed up his nose, and everybody loved it. At, when we turned it in, they laughed, and they were like, yeah, this is perfect, this is perfect. And then as it got closer and closer to the time to send it to press, everybody chickened out and said, no, we're putting these in schools. We don't need to encourage nose picking. So... All I had to do was move his finger out of his nose to the side of his head. That's not, that's not a bad change. That's a pretty easy change. So 
So uh, Bob did a lot of special edition books, short stories, and, uh, and we came up with uh, a character, Curly, who was going to be on all of these books. And this was the very first one in the series. And uh, we were coming up with a character. So we started with this guy here. And nice long hair back, back in the day, believe it or not, with my beautiful hair now. I used to have long hair, and I was like, oh, I'm going to put long hair on this guy, make him kind of rock and rollish, and I'll, he'll be a ghost, and we'll be able to use him. Well, nobody liked him. <laughs> so I took him home. I gave him a haircut, turned him into a skeleton, and Curly was born. And Curly's been on, jeez, uh, I don't know how many covers, but he, for a while, he was on more covers well, than anybody. He used him for a lot of hours. He was never in a book. Correct. There was never a book about him. And then he, he, he got so popular, he got his own mascot, which threw a reader's poll, you guys named Drool. Uh, eventually, we started to do uh, the uh, Series 2000. Uh, for me, I really enjoyed the Series 2000 because I got a chance to uh, get a little bit more drama in my pieces. Uh, when we did regular Goosebumps, there weren't written rules, uh, uh, per se, but, you know, you didn't want to show anybody getting hurt. There was no red blood. Um, tried to keep it light, but when the 2000 series came along, as soon as they said I could, I popped somebody's eyeball out of the socket. <laughs> so when the Goosebumps movie came along, I was, I was excited, and... I couldn't wait to see Jack Black play R.L. Stein, and the movie was moving through production, and I was like, boy, it would be nice to do something for the movie, maybe the movie poster or whatever, and kept going on, and then the movie was finished, and they were getting ready to release it, and I was like, ah, uh, I didn't get a chance to get into the movie. And then at the last minute, it was late in August, and the movie was coming out in October, and the guys from the movie said, hey, uh, we're doing the closing sequence to the movie. And at the end of the movie, Jack Black turns to the camera, he screams, he morphs onto a Goosebumps cover, and the movie goes to credits. And they said, hey, we've been trying to create a fake Goosebumps cover for the end of the movie, and we've been having a really hard time. And he said, and then one of the youngest guys on the crew said, uh, well, why don't we just call up Tim and have him make one? So right at the last minute, I got a chance to do a cover with Jack Black on it. And so I snuck into that movie right at the last two seconds of the movie. And I, I had to tell all my friends, you got to look real fast because it happens real quick. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> As Tim and I, every morning on Instagram, we trade tattoos <laughs> on people's legs and arms. There's more of Tim's art on people than in books. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's starting true, to get that true. way because it started out as yeah. it was a novelty and you're like, Ho you know, holy smokes, oh. I saw somebody with a Goosebumps tattoo. And then as time's gone on, it's become more and more and more. A woman sent me a, one of your pieces of art, was, you know, only in black. She said, I, I have to go back. I fainted. <laughs> and I have to go back for them to do the color. So, you know, it's... I, I have mixed feel, feelings about it because, I, I mean, I love the fact that someone loves the work enough to put it on their body forever. <laughs> but if my son did this, I would have him in the corner by the neck. <laughs> and they get more and more dramatic every year. They, they, we've gone from single uh, images to full sleeves. Those are great. Those are actually great. But my favorites... <laughs> I know, look at that. <laughs> there are people walking around with that. Can you imagine? You know, it's one, thing, it's one thing to have somebody adorn your artwork on there, but boy, oh boy, having your face on somebody, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. That is the ultimate tribute. The ultimate tribute. Yeah, it is. Well, I know we yeah. like, to, I like to kid about that, 
But uh, there is one more thing that I just saw recently that I thought was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> and that's R.L. Stein on a skateboard. You've got to love that. <laughs> At least I'm not on the bottom. He's not stepping on my face. <laughs> All right, guys, that's, that's the end of the slideshow. Oh, I thought you were going to do the comic book cover. <laughs> Terrific. Very good. Are we done? We could be. We, uh, we, there's no Q&A, right? What? No, the room's too big. No, I want to say thank you so much. What a great birthday you've made for me. And how wonderful. <laughs>